Okay, so picture this. Rio de Janeiro, back in the 1800s. No garbage trucks, right? Instead, they had these guys called tigers literally hauling barrels of, well, you know. Yeah. On their backs all the way to the ocean. It sounds kind of crazy now, doesn't it? But it just shows you how sanitation and social structures, they've always been connected. I mean, think about it. No proper sewage system back then. You've got a public health nightmare on your hands. And of course, it kept the inequality going. Talk about a reality check for how far we've come. That's what we're diving into today, the world of sanitation. You sent over a whole bunch of research papers, government reports, even some historical accounts, all about sanitation in Brazil and Canada. Specifically, we're honing in on the Brazilian state of Santa Catarina and Ontario, Canada. Yeah, and we'll be your guides as we unpack all the key insights from this material. We're going to compare how these two countries, how they've tackled sanitation over the years, what kind of impact it's had on public health, their economies, and of course, how government policies come into play. We'll also get into that debate about whether it should be the public or private sector calling the shots on sanitation. It's a hot topic, that's for sure. Or no. And to bring it all home, we'll tie these sanitation stories back to the bigger picture, those UN Sustainable Development Goals, especially the ones about clean water, sanitation, and building sustainable cities. Think of it like your crash course on all things sanitation, but way more interesting than reading a textbook. Exactly. So we're talking about two countries with totally different backgrounds, Brazil and Canada. Let's kick things off with Brazil. Their sanitation story is, well, let's just say it's complicated. One of the things that really jumps out from the research is this huge gap between how many people have piped water versus how many have their sewage treated. You see, Brazil has actually done a, a pretty decent job of getting water to people, at least in cities. Back in 2018, over 98% of people in Brazilian cities had access to piped water. At least that's according to their National Sanitation Information System, which they call SNIS. So far, so good, right? Well, hold on a second. Here's the thing. That same year, only about 46% of sewage actually got treated. It's kind of like a, imagine dumping thousands of Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of uncreated sewage into the environment every single day. Yikes. That's uh, not exactly what I'd call progress. So what are they doing about it? Well, they're not just ignoring it. I can tell you that. In 2020, they brought in this whole new legal framework for sanitation, trying to attract private investment to help boost those treatment rates. So is that the answer? Bringing in these private companies? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Some experts, they argue that these private companies, they've got the money, they've got the know-how to get things done quickly, more efficiently. But then you've got others who are really worried about what it'll mean for everyday people. Will costs go up? Will these companies actually prioritize poorer communities? It's a tough one. It's a tough balancing act for sure. But before we uh, get too far down that pipe, let's hop over to Canada for a sec. Canada's sanitation story is a whole different animal, right? Absolutely. See, Canada, they went all in on public health infrastructure way earlier than Brazil did. And this whole public service mindset, it's literally written into their constitution. They've got this principle called peace, order, and good government that really shapes how they handle these things. So it's a much more centralized approach, government run for the most part. You got it. And, you know, for the most part, it's been pretty successful. Take Ontario, for example. They've got a very solid sanitation system, thanks in large part to the Ontario Clean Water Agency. Sounds like they've got it all figured out. But nobody's perfect, oh, yeah. right? You're telling me, remember that Walkerton water crisis back in 2000? Contaminated drinking water. People died. Others got really sick. It was a stark reminder that even when you think you've got a good system, you can never let your guard down on things like regulations and oversight. Okay, so we've got two countries, two very different approaches, both with their pros and cons. But to really wrap our heads around how this all plays out in the real world, let's zoom in on some specific places. Now you're talking. Looking at individual municipalities in Santa Catarina and Ontario will give us a much clearer picture, I think. Love it. We're talking Casador, Videra, and Concordia in Santa Catarina, and then Salt St. Marie, Thunder Bay, North Bay, Chatham-Kent, Woodstock, and Kenora over in Ontario. And here's something that we found super interesting in the research. You've got municipalities with almost identical economies, maybe both big on agriculture or both focused on industry, but their sanitation coverage is totally different. Wait, really? Why is that? Tell me more. Well, that's what we're here to figure out. We'll be digging into things like historical data, government initiatives, even what local communities are doing themselves to understand these differences. Okay, now you've got me hooked. I'm actually really interested to see where this goes. All right, so let's dive into these towns. Let's start with Casador in Brazil. 
It's this hub for agriculture and industry, known for its apples and tomatoes, timber too. And when you look at their sanitation story, it kind of mirrors what we see in a lot of Brazilian municipalities. Decent progress when it comes to getting people water, but sewage treatment still lagging behind. Yeah, it sounds familiar. So it's like that national trend, but on a smaller scale. Exactly. Back in 2010, more than 86% of homes in Casador had piped water, but only about 66% had their sewage properly treated. And, you know, they've made efforts to expand the sewage network, but that gap, it hasn't really budged all that much. I'm guessing money or the lack of it is a big part of the problem, like getting the funds to build these infrastructure projects. Bingo. Financing these kinds of projects, it's a massive challenge, especially for these towns and cities with smaller budgets. But here's where it gets interesting. Casador, they got creative. Back in 2006, they formed something called a Gestam Associata. It basically means associated management. Essentially, the town, the state government, and this company called CanSan, which is the state water and sanitation company, they all teamed up. They joined forces. Exactly. Yeah. And this collaboration, it actually helped them build new reservoirs and improve the whole water supply system, which was huge, by the way, because they used to have these chronic water shortages. So teamwork makes the dream work, as they say. It shows how important it is to have the government involved, right? I mean, providing these essential services. Absolutely. Okay, so now let's compare that to a town in Ontario, Woodstock. It's a similar size to Casador, pretty similar economy too, agriculture, food processing, that sort of thing. Okay, so what's the sanitation situation like in Woodstock? Well, they've got the advantage of being in Ontario, which means they're plucked into this really well-funded, very robust system. So they're hooked into these wastewater treatment plants run by Oxford County, which handles sewage for over 76,000 people, plus tons of businesses and industries. It's pretty impressive, actually. Wow, night and day compared to Casador. It seems like that government investment, having that solid infrastructure in place, makes a world of difference. For sure. All right, next up, we've got Videra, Brazil. They actually call themselves the capital of grapes, wine, fruits, pigs, and poultry in Santa Catarina. Okay, now that's a title I can get behind. Sounds like a delicious place to visit. I'm adding Videra to my travel bucket list. It's a foodie's paradise, that's for sure. But just like Casador, they're having a tough time expanding sewage treatment. Mm. In 2010, almost 80% of households had it, which is better than it used to be, but that still leaves a lot of folks without this essential service. Right, so how does that compare to a similar sized place in Ontario? Good question. Let's look at North Bay, Ontario. It's right there on Lake Nipissing, mm -hmm. beautiful spot. Similar population to Videra. And they handle sanitation through this like really well-regulated system. They even updated their whole sewer use bylaw back in 2014 right. just to make sure they were staying ahead of the curve that their infrastructure could handle anything. Proactive planning, I like it. It's like you can't just build the system and forget about it. You have to keep adapting, keep evolving, right, Tat? Speaking of which, let's move on to Concordia in Brazil. Now, they've got a pretty diverse economy, a mix of agriculture, agro-industry, even some manufacturing. What's the sanitation story there? So Concordia has actually done a pretty impressive job of increasing their sanitation coverage. Back in 2010, over 73% of homes had proper sewage treatment. Oh. But here's where it gets interesting. They've used a mix of what we call collective and individual sanitation systems. Hold on. Individual systems? What does that even mean? So imagine this. Instead of connecting every single house to one central sewage network, some areas, they have their own individual septic systems. Yeah. This is actually more common in the past when it was more difficult to extend those central networks everywhere, especially in these more spread out municipalities. Yeah, that makes sense. Why build a whole network if you don't have to, right? But are these individual systems effective? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? It really depends. Things like the type of soil you have, yeah. how well the system's maintained, it's complicated. But it highlights this need for flexible solutions, right? Ones that can adapt to the different local conditions you find in these places. Now, for a Canadian comparison, let's go to Sault Ste. Marie. It's a city known for its history. It's on the St. Mary's River. Really beautiful. Oh, I've heard of Sault Ste. Marie. Okay, so how do they handle sanitation? They're very serious about it. I can tell you that. They've got this modern, very well-maintained infrastructure, which really reflects how committed Ontario is to providing safe and reliable sanitation services. Okay, I'm starting to see a theme here. Ontario is all about that systematic approach to sanitation. Right. They put a lot of money into their infrastructure. They've got this strong regulatory framework. It's like they've cracked the code. 
So it seems like both Brazil and Canada, they have their own unique way of doing things when it comes to sanitation. But ultimately, they both want the same thing, right? To make sure everyone has access to these safe and reliable services. Exactly. And that's where those sustainable development goals come in those SDGs. They provide this kind of global game plan for how we can tackle these essential challenges. Okay, so let's talk about those sustainable development goals, the SDGs, as they're called. How do these sanitation stories we've been discussing, how do they fit into those big global goals? Well, think of the SDGs like, you know, a roadmap, a roadmap to a more sustainable future for everyone. And all the UN member states, they signed off on them back in 2015. Mm. Now, when we're talking sanitation, there are two goals that are particularly relevant. Goal six, that's all about making sure everyone has access to clean water and sanitation. And then there's goal 11, which focuses on sustainable cities making sure cities are safe and sustainable places to live. Right. Okay. So how are Brazil and Canada doing when it comes to these goals? Are they on track? Well, if you look at Brazil, they've made some good progress, I'd say, in terms of getting safe drinking water to more people. But that sewage treatment gap we talked about, that's still a major problem for them. It's a big reason why they're lagging behind on SDG 6. That new legal framework they introduced in 2020, that was a step in the right direction for sure. Yeah. But it's still too early to say what kind of impact it's really having. Yeah. And what about those inequalities we talked about? You know, how some communities still lack access to basic sanitation. Exactly. It's not just about building the infrastructure, the pipes, the treatment plants. It's about making sure everyone benefits. And too often, it's the rural areas, the low-income communities that get left behind. And that's a huge barrier, obviously, to achieving real sanitation equality. So room for improvement in Brazil, it sounds like. What about Canada? They seem to be doing pretty well on the sanitation front. Yeah, Canada is definitely one of the high achievers when it comes to both SDG 6 and 11. Mm -hmm. They've got that high sanitation coverage. They focus a lot on sustainable urban planning. They're doing a lot of things right. But they must have some challenges too, right? Nobody's perfect. Oh, absolutely. They've got aging infrastructure that needs constant upkeep. They've got to adapt to climate change. And like you said, nobody's perfect. Yeah. They need to keep investing, keep innovating if they want to stay ahead of the game. It's a never-ending process, isn't it? So what can we do to speed things up? How do we make sure everyone has access to safe sanitation in Brazil, in Canada, everywhere? The million-dollar question. Well, a big part of it is money, of course. We need more investment in sanitation infrastructure, especially in countries like Brazil. And that might mean finding creative financing solutions, like maybe those public-private partnerships we were talking about earlier. Right, but it's got to be more than just throwing money at the problem, right? Exactly. We need transparency. We need accountability. We need to make sure that those investments are actually benefiting the people who need it most. And that means having strong regulations in place, making sure those services are safe and high quality. And we can't forget about the Walkerton crisis. A stark reminder that even the best systems can fail if we're not careful. Exactly. And, you know, we haven't even talked about the importance of community engagement and education. We need people to understand why sanitation matters. We need them to be on board with things like conserving water, disposing of waste properly. It's about changing behaviors, really. Getting everyone to see themselves as part of the solution. Absolutely. This isn't just a job for governments or big companies. We all have a role to play. Well, this has been fascinating. I have to admit, I didn't think I'd be so interested in sanitation. It's not exactly the most glamorous topic, but it's so important. I know, right? It just goes to show you can find these fascinating stories and global connections in the most unexpected places. That's what we're here for. Dig a little deeper, uncover those hidden gems of knowledge. And on that note, we'll leave you with this thought. What role can you play in making sure everyone has access to safe sanitation? It's a question worth pondering. Until next time, keep diving deep.